So, dear friends, we're going to continue the lesson in the Kitzur of the Maharan. Torah from Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. I'm here by the holy grave of Rabbi Meir Shapiro, the one who came up with the Daf Yomi. So, in his schools, we're going to learn here. Holy Torah. So, we left off at 168. When a person is haunty, it is a sign that trouble will come upon him. May God save us. Conversely, when he is humble and low-spirited, he will come to receive great honor. So a person who has pride, he, he, he finds himself with a lot of pride. So that is the signal that he's going to fall from his place. Well, a person who has humility, they feel very humble about their accomplishments in Torah and Yiddishkeit, that is a sign that they're going to go up in Madrega. It's a very important teaching in Hasidus and Kabbalah to be humble, to have humility, because that is the way to enter into the spiritual realms. It's not taught enough today in Shirim. It's not taught enough in, enough in Yeshivos that a person has to work on humility. You meet a person for the first time and he's already telling you every, all his accomplishments in life, how good he is, how great he is. He needs you to give him self-worth. But the sages, they would be humble. They would spill all their beans just by meeting somebody, they had true humility. That's why they kept going up and up and up in Madrega. So it's very important to follow and pursue the path of humility. Number 169. Through his bodhidus, now his bodhidus is the idea of speaking to God in one's own words. So whereby a person evaluates and judges himself whether it is fitting for him to behave as he does and he re rectifies his actions so that he will act according to the laws and ordinances of the Torah. Strict judgments are there, thereby rectified. Consequently, the person attains joy until he dances of sheer happiness. So, a person who evaluates himself, and this is something that is very strong in the Muslim movement, we need to bring it back also. He evaluates himself regularly on his performance in serving God, his Creator. When he makes that evaluation, he removes judgments and he fixes himself. And he attains joy from this. Person, but this is what Dr. Melch said, you know, my, I, I'm as white as snow. He uses this expression. Why? I, I feel clean. I'm clean before God. And therefore, it, 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 he was able to find joy. Person who is clean, he, doesn't, he knows that he's put everything before his master. He feels a, a level of purity, of cleanliness. He attains joy. The underlying cause behind wasting seed and transgression is sadness and, and melancholy, depression. That's when a person is happy, Hashem then guards that person's purity. That's, that is, Hashem helps him to maintain holiness. So the reason why a person sins in this matter is because they're depressed and down. If a person is happy, they won't sin before God. And when they're happy, God Himself will guard them. That they are that they do not fall into this, this, this level of sin. 170. By means of suffering and troubles that a person experiences, his physicality and his body are thereby subdued. In turn, his inner spiritual essence and his soul are enhanced and become more luminous. As a result, he can carry rays up and elevate many people to their root. So 
Sometimes a person has experienced some level of sickness, some difficulties, where their body is subdued, so their soul can then shine, that they can reach a higher level spiritually. Sometimes they need to be put down a little bit. And when your soul becomes luminous in this, from and the way to attain higher levels through this is when you have suffering in your life, you look for the good. You look to attain the good. You look for the for Hashem in that suffering without complaining. And then you elevate everything. The illness, you elevate yourself. And therefore, you can raise up many people with the connection you receive from God in these situations of difficulty. You know, some of the most inspirational people, if you meet a lot of people, are, are, are those who have gone through a lot in their life. They inspire you. They help bring you up mentally, spiritually, emotionally. They, they give you something special. That's because they went and they suffered these troubles and they found God in those, in those difficult situations. And they are therefore elevated. And that elevation that they experience is an elevation that can bring others up with them. Number 171, when a new insight in the service of God is awakened and revealed, it always has two powers. It has the aspect of the Sadiqim will walk in them, whereby a person may then serve God with this new idea. And it also has the aspect of sinners will stumble in them, whereby a person does not serve God with this new idea. Rather, he uses it to belittle and disgrace others in that he himself knows about the new insight, but other people do not. When you have a new insight into the Torah, you need to be humble about it. You need to spread the Torah. You should, you should have two aspects where you can go in and thereby elevate or it can bring down. You can use it to for negativity. So it's important to be humble with your insights in the Torah. You know, a lot of times you, if you're with somebody and they have a Dvar Torah to share with you, and they're so excited about it. But sometimes you can you feel like they, they're telling you the Dvar Torah out of pride. Not because of the true love of the Torah, but because they want to show how great of a scholar they are. So this is, a, like, this is the same type of thing, saying if you come up with a new insight in the Torah, don't use it in a way to show your greatness. How, 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 and, and for, love, for to attain levels of pride. But, but be, be humble with it. And then it's going to go in bring blessing. In 172, everything that a person lacks, be it children or livelihood or health, is all due to a deficiency in the person himself. For God's light and His bounty are shining upon a person at all times. But a person, because of his involvement in physicality and his evil deeds, creates a shadow for himself so that God's light does not reach him. And this, in turn, is responsible for all that he lacks. Therefore, if a person merits to rectify his deeds and his character traits, and to purify his physical nature to the point that he nullifies himself completely, and enters the concept of nothing, of vital, having no connection to this world at all, he, create, he, he ceases to create a shadow. He then merits to receive God's light in all its fullness, and he attains what he lacks. God is only good. God wants to give His light. He wants to give kindness. That's what He created us. He created people to share with it, with, with, with people His light, to share His kindness. So why wouldn't He give us everything that we need? Why would He want us to suffer? He does not want us to suffer. He wants us to draw close to Him. So, if we are going to bring down this, 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 this kindness, this, the, the, the things that we, that we are lacking, that we need, we have to stop blocking them. It's us that's blocking it. It's brought in other places that if we do kindness down here below, then God does kindness from above. So all that's waiting for Him to shine His light and, and give us what we need is us to do something here below, some act of kindness so He can shine His kindness down. But Rabbi Nachman is saying something even more so here. He's saying that all the light is ready to come to you. That new pair of shoes, 
that new car, that new house, all that materialism that you, that you might need. Everything is ready to come down to you, but it's you who's blocking it. You're making a shadow so it can't come down, right? And where is that coming in the spheros? You sow, you sow is foundation. Your sow is, is, is catching everything, but it can't go down to Malchut, right? Your sow it has to do with the brismila, it has to do with Kedusha and holiness. Once we are holy, once we are worthy of the light, worthy of everything that we need, then we're going to have it. Why would God not want to give it to us? It's only us that's casting the shadow. We're blocking the light. If we do tshuva, if we connect to God, we're going to get everything that we could possibly need. Completely. We're not going to suffer in any way, shape, or form. So, continue. The Torah sages who are associated with this concept of nothingness, vital, merit honor, which is a primary manifestation of God's light. God's light comes from a person being the Vatel themselves being humble, then his light shines. When God, and certainly a tzaddik, shows a joyous confidence, this means life and good for the world. The opposite is also true, God forbid. So, when we're humble also, that's part of that ingredient that we need to bring that light down to us. That bring us all that, that we require. If we demand of Shem and say, you know, you, you owe me this. Give me this. Like, give me, give me. You know, I deserve this. Then we're also casting a shadow. But when we're humble, we're not casting any shadow on that light. And that Shefa and the blessing that we're looking for is going to come. When we have that Muna and God, we, we, we get rid of that, 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 that pride and we purify ourselves. Then Everything we need is, is coming down. It's ready to come. It's, it's there. God is a giver. He's not a taker. He's a giver. He's waiting for you to give. He's waiting to give to you. And the mitzvahs and commandments of Torah, this is our gift of, of giving back to Him. And the, but, the, but they're there for us. The mitzvahs are for us. Number 173, the soul and faith are one and the same concept. Now there exists the world of faith. Which is the place from which the action of faith is taken. And the world of faith itself is also, also has faith in God. This later faith is the root of all faith, a root of all Muna, is the inner essence of Muna. Sorry, repeat that twice. Now, when a person writes, he puts his soul into the writing, as in, I put my soul into the writing, as it says in, in the Talmud Shabbos. Therefore, by looking at a person's writing, the true sage can know about a person's soul. Just from looking at his handwriting, we know that that's, that's so in in, in, in um, there's, there's methods of you know there's uh, therapists that look at the handwriting they can tell you you know what you need to work on with the children yourself so we know that it's from the handwriting you can see but it's also coming from the Torah this idea so that you can see his inner essence his faith and the root of this person's faith through the, the writing. The words that a person speaks with the true sage, whoever, are on a higher level than his writing. This is because writing is only an activity of the soul, whereas speech is a soul itself. Right? We know speech is connected, the mouth is connected to Malchut. It's connected to the Shrina. So you reveal a person's connection to the Shrina when you listen to when you listen to them speak. You know how connected they are to God. So, back in. Therefore, from a person's speech, the tzaddik can actually see the essence of the soul itself. We need to take much more attention to how we speak to other people, how we communicate. We teach our children that when they talk, that their words should be weighed shouldn't speak Lashon Hara, it shouldn't waste words. Words are holy. Everything is connected to the Shekinah that we're saying. For good or for bad, we can chase the Shekinah away by not speaking with thought. At the same time, vice versa, we can bring the Shekinah closer to us when we speak calmly, with wisdom and understanding. What comes out of our mouth is so vital of importance. And I don't think a person can truly appreciate the gift of speech until they do a Tanis Tibor, 
where they go and they take a day or half a day and they don't talk at all. And then they teach themselves to think before they speak because a lot of people just blurt out whatever comes to mind. No, we have to go and, and, and value what comes out of our mouth and you'll see that once you, you the, 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 the mouth is an instrument. So once you, you appreciate the instrument, once you train the instrument, you're gonna see that it can play beautiful music. They play beautiful sounds, but only when you appreciate speech. And the only way that I found to do it was to do a time this debor where you're not, where you're taking like a fast of the, of, the, of speaking. And there are places in Hasidus where a lot of the rebels said that this is more important than a fast of the body is a fast of the, of the mouth. I, I don't know why we don't do that more. It would be much more of value than, than, than breaking the body. We need to break the mouth because that's what gets us in trouble, right? There's no. Din, there's no judgment in, in the heavens on a person until they speak Lashon Hara. But if they, they, they guard their mouth, the judgment can wait to Yom Kippur. They can do tshuva. They have more time to do tshuva. Repent. But the second you speak Lashon Hara, you, you're judged in, in the heavens because God doesn't want Lashon Hara. He doesn't want you to speak ill of other people. This is, this is very negative. So you have to go and appreciate the power of the speech and realize that it's connected to the Shrina. Then we would guard it more. Never can you, how can you fan from there saying a curse word out of your mouth when the Shrina is connected there? How can you say that? How can you even use slang or not talk? The, the, there, are, there are certain rabbis that only will speak in Lashon HaKodesh, they'll only speak in Hebrew because they don't want to to to, to impel the, 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 the speech that they know is connected to lie. It's why a lot of the one uh, people are speaking in Yiddish. It's, uh, it's its own language for the Jewish people. Maybe obviously, they mix it from German, but they, they feel that this is a more holier language where we won't mix in the words from outside. That's the idea of it. Number one seventy four. With strict judgments are upon a person. God forbid. Those who pray for him should not mention his name explicitly, so that the judgments do not rise up against him even more, God forbid. Um, so we know that when we pray for someone in general, we, we want to we, we say we're praying in their merit, we say their name and their mother's name. But we're not going to say there could be a level of them that's so high that it could be even more important to just think about the person and pray for it not to draw extra attention. It's the only place that I've seen this, but one second it says here in Magin, he's quoting from Magin Avram in Or Chaim. 119 is, is a source for this. So we can check that out more. Now a lot of times People feel like they, if they don't have the full name of a person, they can't pray for them. Well, I need to know your England, your mother, the mother's name, the, the, the father's name. I mean, God knows who you're talking about. Yes, it's good to use the names; it's important. But we go to the bedside of a sick person. We don't pray in his name. We, he's there. We're connected to the soul. So more important than even the name is just to connect completely to the soul. Um, but at the same time, the, the, the name reveals the essence of the person. It, it connects the person to, to that, that soul root. That's why, for me, sometimes when I ask people to pray for me, which I try to keep my problems to myself, but on those occasions that I, that I, that I ask people to pray, I, I, and I post it on the computer, where a lot of people are going to see it, I don't usually post my name. People are saying, watch, what's your name? Because I, I know that giving my name out is like giving my soul root out to people, where they have a, a key to unlock one of the doors of my soul, because that's how powerful it is. If we concentrate on a person's name, it, it's very, very great. You can go and completely bring them from judgment to, to kindness, which is what Rabbi Nachman is saying here. There can be such a level of din where if you just think about the person and you think about him in, in a good light, you can completely erase all of the judgment against him. Whereas if you take the name, maybe, maybe you could go and bring more judgment in some way. But this is, this is a complicated thing. So, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But we, we spoke about how, how, how truly great it is. The person's name, and also sometimes not to. Anyway, let's move on. 171, 175. Crying is most beneficial when it is motivated by joy and happiness. 
is also very good when crying is motivated by joy that is due to a person's great joy in God. He becomes filled with contrition, he aches over the fact that he has rebelled against him, and he's then moved to cry as a result of his joy. I'll say something from the Gemara on here that it says that when a person is young, crying is actually healthy for the eyes. But when a person is older, I think over the age of 40, crying is is not so good for the eyes. It can hurt the eyesight over time, so this person shouldn't cry so much when they're older. But, but, that, but it says that crying for, for, because of joy is not like that. So when we're talking about crying, we're saying crying on something that's uh, of su- suffering and sadness. But crying for joy, that you return to God is a good thing. Sometimes we reach a level of tshuva, repentance to God, and we, that we, we feel like something is lifted off of our shoulders and we cry out to God, this is a cry of joy of, of, of returning, this is something that's very beneficial. So that would not hurt the eyesight uh, as in the Gemara when saying, uh, crying because of, of, of... It also says in the Gemara that a person shouldn't cry too much over something bad that happens. If they, if they lose someone, they, they, yes, you need a release, but crying too much is, is, it can be very unhealthy and I believe there was a story in the Mar where, where, where someone was born and said, don't cry so much because you're going to cause more of your children to die. They already lost one child, but if you cry, you're so broken, you can't continue. You're bringing more, more din. You need to still accept in some way God's, God's will. And, they, and, and I think something happened, they, and, they, and something else bad happened because they couldn't stop crying and crying. So everything has to have its balance. 175, a person needs to act swiftly to banish from his heart the spirit of folly that has possessed it and clings to it. By attaching to the true sage, that is, by loving the tzaddik with the profound love of the soul, a person thereby banishes the spirit of folly from his heart with great speed and in turn he merits a broken heart. So one important thing that Rabbi Nachman is saying here is the second a spirit of folly enters you, you need to get rid of it right away. The more you let it hover inside you, the greater it's going to get strength. So if you see that you have a feeling to sin and, and to waste time, so push it out quickly. Get rid of it as soon as you can so it doesn't go in and, and, and envelope you. Because once it gets stronger, it'll be more difficult. And how do you do that? You think about the sage, you think about the sadi, how much you love the sadi, how much you love the Torah, and this will help you to have a broken heart and, and cast away this, this, this spirit of folly that has attached itself. 177, there exists a true, true Sadiqim who sometimes have the ability when they drink wine to receive such exalted levels of wisdom and holy mentalities that they thereby atone for and pardon the sins of the Jewish people. As in the verse, but the sage shall pardon, as it says in Proverbs. There's a story in the Lady of Medici where some of the Misnagdim tried to get him drunk and they kept giving him more and more wine to make a chayim with him, but they did not succeed because the, the Sadiq, the more he drinks, the more he has wisdom because wine can bring wisdom and holiness if, if, a, if a true sage is drinking it. Whereas other people, if they were not, were not allowed to get drunk, except on Purim, or other people can get drunk and, and, and be further from God, the sage is connecting to God more so through the wine. And so it says that he can actually nullify the sins of the Jewish people through drinking the wine. And the, first, and, and, and the Jewish people can be pardoned through this. It can be a very, very holy act when a Sage is drinking, that's why a lot of times in Purim you see, you see if you're around the Tzaddik during Purim, where other people are, are being merry and, and running around, his connection to God is never lost on Purim. You see, he's connected, he can drink two bottles of wine, he, 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 he will not lose Das. He will not lose Das because wine for the Tzaddik gives Das. It opens up the Torah to him. A person must totally nullify his own will before God, God's will, so that he should not have any other desire except for what God desires. And whether a person has money or children or whatever he does not, 
God forbid, he must still want only what God wants. When he is satisfied with and desires only what God desires, then he makes God king over himself. So, this is a great concept where you know, it, it, where we nullify our will before the will of God. You know, every person thinks they know what's best for them. They know they, they have a desire for certain materialistic things that they know, they, they feel so strongly about that this is the only way they can serve God is having these items or this situation that they, they have put in their mind that, that would give them the comfort, comfort of mind, body. But it's not always what's best for them. It's not always what's best for a person. What's best for a person is that they are nullified in God's will. That they know that God knows what's best for them. It's not always what they think is best. And this is a very hard concept because sometimes you'll have a mitzvah that you want to do. Like today, I want to go to the Western Wall of Gotha. But because of the lockdown, you know, it's, 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 it's very hard to get in. It's closed. We're not supposed to go, according to the government. Even though it's Narishkite, it's not real. It's not real. And over here, I'm also further than where I'm supposed to be. But God's will, even though my, I can't understand it. I want to go to the holiest place in the world. I want to pray and be close to God. But it isn't His will. It's not His will that I go there. So I nullify myself that I came here to another holy place. This is God's will. God's will is that I'm here at this place at this time. So that's the problem. People think that a mitzvah, that they want to do a certain mitzvah, that they want to go and learn Torah, say full time, but they don't have any money. They, they're completely broke. And their family needs food. They need, and, and they have bills that they owe. Is it God's will that they study Torah and that the bills continue to accumulate? No. If they're sadic, if they're holy and pure, and they have muna, it's, it's at such a level where the chef is coming, the, the blessing is coming through a muna, then the Torah study is blessed. But the, 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 they may be different. But it's brought in the, in the Talmud where there was a sage who went and he studied Torah full time. And he came to a point in his life where he had so much debt, he had to go and completely leave the base, uh, base, base medrash. Completely to go off for six months a year to go and work to pay back all the debts. So what happened? He lost the Torah completely. Whereas if he balanced half day work, half day learning, he would have sustenance and he would also have the Torah. So that's a situation where God's will originally was for him to work and learn. But he decided to take it into his own hands and say, no, God, I want to study. I only want this. When it was clear that the blessing wasn't coming from the study itself and his, and his muna wasn't strong enough to have. If a person has a muna and they study Torah, they don't need to work. There's a level of Rabbi Shun Bar Yochai where it says he was able to, to learn Torah all day long and even his prayer was, was inside the Torah study. And the Mark talks how... how the other great rabbis are saying, well, we can't do what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai did. We need to work. We need to pray. Our Torah study isn't on that level of oh, Rabbi Shimon. But so what, what is a practical way of doing that today? You know, you see people in kolels and yeshivas, and a lot of people are learning full time. They live very simple lives. And some are very successful, while others are living in complete debt and poverty. If you went to Rev. Stein, Steinmann, I'm Steinmann, or Steinmann, something different. <laughs> the Zechisad of Rabbi just passed away, he was a Gadol al Torah. If you went and visited his home, it was the most simple place. Simple furniture, old tiles, but clean. We're talking simple but clean. And some of the followers, they offered to buy the, the Rav a, a new apartment over the years. He didn't want. Didn't, I don't need such a thing, he said. So someone like him, his Torah study has is done with the Shema, and, and his moon and God is strong, where the blessing comes through the Torah study and he doesn't have to work. 
Whereas you have other people, they have to be more practical, and you can't sit there and hide yourself in your studies while your family is suffering and need more materialistic items. And they're not on your level. You're on the level where you're closed in the basement, where they're at the home and they, they're suffering. The, the, the furniture is falling apart. There's, there's not no, there's, they have, they're, they're always in worry where will, 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 will Father bring them money and food? This is not a Torah way. And it's, again, it's a confused way that, that a lot of the Shiva Bhakram have been brought up to. That there's, the, the only way to be considered a scholar is to study all day long. And even we don't work. And not only that, they don't know how to work. So they get to a level in life where the, 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 the wife has children, they have children, and, and slowly but surely, like, she can't work, she's, she's a mother now, and they don't know how to work a job. They don't have any technical ability. They, they only know to study to learn. And it's a problem. If they're on the madrega for that, where they have completed Muna and their wife is on that madrega, in level where she has completed Muna, yes, they can do that, that lifestyle. But then the debts, for those who are not, then the debts start piling up. And then they're living a life of suffering, anxiety. And that's not the way of a scholar. It's not the way of a scholar to live in anxiety. I went to the Warner site of Rebbe. I went to a lot of Rebbe's <laughs> some time ago, but I'll tell you the story here. So, I was at a crossroad, crossroad where I had to decide if I want to work or study full time. And I came to a level where, uh, a point in my life where I felt, well first of all, let me just tell you, I believe a person should both work and study. I don't believe, I believe that work ethics can help a person to study even better. They know how to work and utilize their time and appreciate the time studying. And you know, when you work a job, you're, you're organized, you have a schedule, and it can be very beneficial for a person to then take the, that skill level of working into their study. And they can study even better. There was a, a rabbi I visited, and he said, I have, I have seven sons. Six of them are in Kolo, they're learning full time. And one of them works half a day and he learns half a day. He said, the one that works half a day and learns half a day, he's a bigger scholar than all the other six combined. So, you know, every person is different in what they can handle. So I was at a crossroads and I, crossroad, and I went to all the different rabbis and rabbis and I said, I want to, I feel so strongly about learning right now, I need to learn full time and not work. I didn't have a lot of money. Each one, one by one by one, that's why you, you, you think that the Hasidim, Hasidim are very interesting. As much as they, 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 they believe in, in, in Torah study and spirituality, it's very practical also. Went to the Kalva Rebbe, Zechot the Rafa, Rabbi, I want to learn full time all day. I feel like I have to. He says, No, we work half day, we learn half day. Nicholsburg, Rabbi, I want to learn full time. No, we work half day, we learn half day. Biala, Rabbi, go one by one. I'm going to everyone. I want one person to give me what I'm looking for. Give me permission. Give me your blessing. And they all gave me their blessing. I said, Give me your blessing to completely study full time. I need it. I can't, I can't live without it. And I'll tell you, if you feel this strongly, God is going to bless you in that pathway. The Horner Stipe Rebbe, I came to him and I said to him, I want to study full time completely. Bless me. Bless me. He says, I give you my blessing, but you have to be warned that by choosing this pathway of only a muna and not, uh, still you have to have a kli, you still have to have some way for God to bless you. You need to have some way where, where the money can come in. So we're not talking about being foolish. Okay, still had some way for blessing to come in. He said, be warned that this path is a path with a lot of anxiety and, 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 and stress. If you feel you can handle that anxiety, then go ahead, you'll be blessed. And so I took his blessing 
And I finished the Talmud many, many times during those years where I had this blessing and I felt that strongly that I needed to study. But sometimes this is... Sometimes this is not the, 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 the right path. And at the same time, I knew how to work. I knew if I got into a situation where I needed to, to uh, the money, I had that anxiety, I wouldn't be completely lost in the, wor- in the world of reality, of working. And that's the problem. That the yeshivas need to give the children, the yeshiva bachim, vocational skills. They need to know how to work. They can't just ignore the practical world of, of that people have jobs, that people have to support a family and live, live practically. So in so many yeshiva bachim, I, I've seen over time where they've studied so many years in yeshivas that when the time comes, they're just piling up debt. They, they've lost that in Muna, in, 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 in Hashem, in their learning, where the, the, the blessing isn't coming anymore for the Torah study, which it, it will come if the person has true Muna and they learn the Shema. But they come to a point in their life where the learning isn't working so well. Out so well, and the Shalom bias, you know, it says that most of the Shalom bias problems comes from, from money. The, the Shalom in the house. Because of, of the lack of money, that's, where, that's when the couples start to fight. When they, they feel that pressure and they, and, and they, they don't have what they need, the, the wife doesn't have what she needs to feel comfortable. So they wait until such a point where they break and they have no vocational skills, they don't know how to go into the real world to work, and they just fall further and further, and God forbid they to lead to a divorce and, and much worse things. So therefore, there should in most cases be a balance between working and learning. And so we have to notify our will to God's will and do what He wants, and it's not always what we want. It's not always what we think is best. We can think that, you know, God wants us to study full-time for everyone. Just sit and study, and that's it. And yes, He brought the Torah there for you to study it every minute, every day. But we still live in a practical world. And what did, the, what did the sages do in the time of the Talmud? Most of them worked. Most of them worked and studied. And so it's brought down in the Talmud. They could ask, well, how are they such great scholars if they were, if they were busy working half the day? How were they able to do that? How were they able to, to, to reach such levels of, of, of a scholarship where they, they, they knew that the Talmud ball path completely by heart? How did they reach that level? Because when you do God's will, when you nullify yourself to God's will, then your Torah study is blessed. So the Torah study was blessed to such an extent that they would accomplish much more in a shorter period of time. And, and, and that's why it's so important for a person to work because it gives them an organization. It gives them an organized mind. Whereas if they study Torah full time, they start to slack off after a while. And not use the time wise, they don't appreciate time as much because they can just sit there and study and they start to study slower and, and, and then they, they, they start schmoozing and talking with other people and looking things up off the bookshelf all the time even though they don't really need to. And it just slowly by slowly it's not so, so um, it's losing its holiness. And that's when the Torah study starts to not be as much the Shema and that's when they come into the financial problems of it. Whereas someone like Rashid Bayachai, his Torah study was was mamas with fervor every single day. It was new. It was something new. It was something thriving. So when it's thriving and you have a muna, the blessing will come, and the person wouldn't would find shefa and blessing in their life where they wouldn't need to work. Otherwise, things start to, to open up. So I think we covered that pretty good. Number one seventy eight is necessary to specify one sin. In other words, a person must confess verbally and on each occasion he must articulate in detail everything that he has done against God's will. There are many impediments to this, however. Sometimes a person forgets his sin. Other times he remembers the sin, but it is difficult for him to utter its confession. Through joy of performing a mitzvah, for example, The midst of a wedding, or when a person succeeds in bringing himself to great joy at the time he's performing a mitzvah. So that he dances a great deal out of sheer happiness. He will thereby be able to articulate a verbal confession, and in this way correct the blemish caused by his sins. So sometimes, 
We can't remember the source of our sin. We, we're so accustomed to sinning against God. It becomes so second nature. It says in the Gemara, once a person sins once, twice, the third time, it becomes easier to him. It becomes, not only easier to him, it becomes part of him. He doesn't even know it's, that it's wrong anymore. He doesn't feel it's, it's wrong. That's why it's so important to catch his sin early. For the first, second time, not to let it go on. Once it catches the third time, that's it. It's so hard to break it. It's, 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 it's part of the, it becomes part of the person's nature. It says in the Talmud, it takes 40 days to break any bad trait or nature. So if a person wants to repent, he needs to go and be 40 days without this sin, and it will help him to abolish it completely. That's Ras Hashem. So we, we're not going to say we have to specify, be very specific on what this, this sin we're repenting for, if we want to, to be forgiven for it. Be, be very specific to it. And, and, and being joyous around mitzvot, about the chasanas and weddings, and if you dance a lot. So this is going to help you to repent and to see yourself clearly what you've done wrong and what you can improve upon to repent on. Through joy, a person is able to go and uncover the sins that have, they've, they've covered over with the, with in, their, in their mind. And joy is going to help to open themselves up. Without joy, you can't repent. A person who's depressed isn't going to repent to God. He's too depressed. So you have to be joyous, and that's going to help you to uncover your sins. Number 179. Godel Balas Atanis. The great benefit of fasting. Fasting nullifies both physical and spiritual conflict. For when a person is not able to pray or to do what he needs to do in the service of God, this is also considered a conflict. Fasting is very beneficial in this regard, in that it subdues the heart and attaches it to the Holy One. Blessed be He, it makes peace. Fasting revives the dead. Yes, amazing. That is to say, it brings back to life the days that pass in darkness and that have no life in them. In other words, when a person spoils any given day by not performing mitzvahs and the deeds on that day, not to mention if he should actually do evil on that day, God forbid, then he has no life in it. And the person has, in effect, killed that day. Fasting, however, brings these bad days back to life. It all depends on the fast. The more a person fasts, the more bad days that pass in darkness, he revives. By fasting, a person merits joy, and the more days he fasts, the greater the joy he attains. Now, the Baal Shem Tov, who was the great grandfather of Rabbi Nachman, so he came out with a with a uh, order saying that in today's day, fasting is not the best practice because fasting can bring a person to sadness. Physically, people's body is not strong enough to fast on a regular basis. So he was against fasting in, in general. But there still is a source for this. And even Rabbi Nachman, who did not go and teach his followers to, to do many fasts, it still must be appreciated that, that, that fasting still has a power to go and rectify a person's sins, where a person can get to a point where they're sinning so much and they can't stop, it's, they, they can't reset themselves. And only through fasting is a person able to then really reset them their, themselves on a better path. So, so there comes to a point where this is the only way back to, to return to God is, is, is the fasting. So we see it, 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 it nullifies that inner conflict a person may have. And I'm not suggesting people fast. I'm very against it today, where there's so many people with hypoglycemia, low blood sugars, and other physical ailments. But at the same time, there is, even in, 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 in medical science, an idea of fasting where it can clean the blood. There is, there is, there is a point to it. There is, it, is, it is still beneficial. 
So, but in general, too many facts can lead to depression and sadness. We continue 180. This lesson discusses some of the some of the ideas of of of, of, of the underlying the efficiency of the redemption given to the tzaddik. Very short sentence there. Have to see the lesson, the full lesson on that one. Number one eighty one. When, when a number of people get together and oppose one person, even if this other person is of greater importance than they, they can still cause them to fall. Rather than the people opposing are not wicked, since a bond among the wicked does not count, as it says in Sanhedrin. But if these people are not wicked, they're capable of knocking down the person whom they oppose through their bond of conspiracy, even though each one of them individually is inferior to them. If, however, the person whom they oppose is very great, then, to the contrary, they are nullified before him. Whenever a person is knocked down in the manner just described, the essence of this downfall is that he falls into the craving of of, of some immorality, God save us. Everything that is said against a true tzaddik and against his followers is actually highly beneficial for them, both physically and spiritually, because these are very are the very things that stand you up. So, if you know, the, first I want to come out and say. That if there is machlokis, if there is disagreement between rabbis, it is not your job to get involved in this. It's not your job, even though that sage may want you to fight his battles for him, it's not your job to do so. It's very bad for the soul to be involved in, 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 in conflict. A person must train himself to always and only be involved in, in peaceful things. That's what's beneficial for the soul. So stay out of conflict. Can't reiterate that enough. Don't get involved in, in disputes between among rabbis. So you can see that if there is a dispute and the dispute is against a rabbi and that rabbi who they're disputing from is actually holier than them and they're making a mistake, then it's them that's going to go and be confused and go down in Madrid from, 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 from pursuing a higher sage. Now, for the sage who is holier, and his followers who are holier, and they have conflict against them, this conflict strengthens them. It helps them to, to unite together in, 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 amongst themselves, and it actually strengthens them. It's not actually harmful to them. It actually helps the sadi, the sage, it raises the din, the judgment against him, and he's able to reach a higher level. So, anyway, either way, you stay out of conflict because it's not good. A person must train their soul to look for the good in every single person. So even if there might be something bad, if someone needs to pursue that for some reason and, and bring out that bad to light against this person, maybe they believe that he's teaching Torah and he's not worthy. So if this person feels he needs to pursue him, then let him do that battle. You always look for good because that's the... If you look at everything with an eye and tongue, with a good eye, you're going to train yourself to, to live a life of positivity. And if you're going to go and start to look for, for negativity, you're going to cling to negativity when you're not supposed to as well. Stay out of battles. Look for good. Number 182, everything that people talk about throughout the days of the counting of the Omer, all relate exclusively to the Sphira associated with that particular day. A person who understands these matters will be able to hear and know this. If he listens carefully to what people are discussing, he will hear that their talk relates exclusively to the Sphira of that particular day. So we all know that we count the Omer from Pesach, to like Romer, to Shuas, and then these these counting numbers, there are Kabbalistic things behind behind the, the counting of different different days we can work on different character traits. So Renato's saying something even greater here. He's saying that if you were to just listen to your surroundings 
and everything that's going around around you in your life, you will see the Omer shining light in those days, that, that it will correspond to the counting. Because inside the sphere and the, the counting where we're being elevated to receive the Torah Shavuos is great, great rectifications that every single day of that, the counting is, is very great. 183, the Sadiqim, the sages of the generation, sit in the form of a circle and they are like a court of law with God as the head of the court. From these sages, judgment comes out to each and every person either to the side of innocence or the side of guilt. Similarly, the Sadiqim dispense lively the blessing to each and every person as is appropriate for him. The most important thing is that there should be such great love among these sages that is as if they can actually see each other even though they're, they're not physically together. So the sages of the generation, more than they may realize, are connected together, bringing light to the generation. And that's why it's so important when you see Sadiqim coming together at weddings, sometimes you see them together, one side sage is visiting another sage. It's a very great thing to be a witness to that. But Rabbi Nathan is saying that even if they don't gather together, the sages are forming a circle around the Jewish people, around the, around the people, and they're they're, past, they're, they're, they're giving a, a judgment against the cloud, and they're, and they're bringing shepherd and blessing down to, to the people through their spiritual connection to each other. And through that spiritual connection, they're bringing blessing. They're bringing blessing to the, to, to the, to the nation. Number 184, when a person speaks with his friend about the fear of God, even if his friend does not receive anything from him, nevertheless, the person himself receives spiritual inspiration from his friend. This explanation of the explanation of this is that when the words leave a person's mouth, directed at his friend, the light of these words is reflected back to him. If he were to speak these same words to himself, it could very well be that they would not inspire him in the least. But since he spoke these words to someone else, even though his friend was not inspired by them, nonetheless he himself is inspired by them because the words bounce back to him in the aspect of impacting as when someone strikes and throws something against a wall, and that very thing returns to him. So, even in a situation like now, I'm just giving it over to Bartara, and I don't, maybe none of you will get anything out of it, God forbid. But I myself, if the words are bouncing back, they're reflecting, I hear them with my ears, and they are enough to inspire me. So sometimes we need to say over Torah and inspire other people just to inspire ourselves, because if we say it to ourselves, it's not gonna do anything. It's not going to do anything to just meditate on it. We need to, to, to release it out of our mouth. And then that Torah will, will be enthralled in, in, in our entire body and mind and heart. So it's very important to speak over your study, not just keep it inside. So we're going to conclude here by the grave of but Mayor Shapiro, they have an idea in Shemayim for his inspiration for us to study the Torah, just to be in his presence is a great exclus. I always leave my book here, Path Fishing the Talmud, and leave it here. If anyone wants to check it out, come visit the grave of Mayor Shapiro. It inspired me to write it, and we're blessed.
Shalom, shalom from...